Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, uh, it's 8.30. I always like to start things on time, I always found, especially in the era of Zoom. Uh, starting meetings late actually penalizes those people who uh, show up on time. So yeah, thanks for coming on my presentation on implementing and managing electronic data disposal and, and destruction. My name is Ben Rothke, based in New York City. I'm with uh, TAPAD. Uh, we're a, uh, in the uh, advertising tech space. Um, just here's the quick disclaimer, which you'll see in every presentation. Uh, everything I say is not uh, reflective of my employer or the RSA conference. So uh, let's get started. We've got uh, 50 minutes to talk about this. Officially, it's 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. But if, uh, if you need, please come up to the mic and ask a question. If you, if, uh, you know, something needs to be clarified, uh, you want to interject something. Um, so th there's a lot in the security industry, there's a lot of uh, FUD. Um, but this problem is real. I mean, you know, one FUD, last week there was uh, a report about you shouldn't uh, charge your uh, cell phones, your electronic devices in public USB, char uh, public, it, in USB charging stations because uh, hackers could uh, hack your phone that way. Theoretically, yes, practically, you know, we haven't had any instances in, in airports where uh, hackers have loaded malware. But with this, when it comes to uh, data destruction, this is a real, this is a legitimate issue. Um, Morgan Stanley last year fined $35 million over improper uh, data disposal, sanitization, data destruction issues. Just real quick, th th there's a lot of terms used interchangeably, data disposal, data sanitization. Sanitiza sanitization is a term used in a NIST standard. Uh, we'll talk about that later, but it's all relatively the same overall topic. Um, hard drives sold on eBay still contain leftover data. The reason uh, this is occurs is because you know, companies are just oblivious uh, to the need. Uh, so this is a very real problem. This has happened, this has happened you know, over the course of years. Uh, it could be embarrassing many times. Uh, there was a uh, uh, copy machine some years ago, I think it was a Rochester Police Department, um, had you know, tens of thousands of pages of confidential police records. Um, now, when you buy you know, any device, you're not just buying the device, uh, they come with massive hard drives. And so too with a copier, when you're scanning things, these have hard drives, and the hard drives you know, contain a lot of uh, data. Um, and so when you're buying a, a copier, or when you're selling it, you, know, you have to be aware of these issues. So this is just you know, five, six stories uh, to let you know. That we could have, you know, I could have filled you know, many, many pages uh, with real world. But the issue is, this is real, this is an issue, and this is something you know, every organization needs to deal with. Also, this is not a, a new issue. You know, we have zero day issues where something comes out of the blue, you suddenly have to patch really quickly, uh, you know, get your team involved. But, you know, this goes back many, you know, 25 plus years. Peter Gutman, who's uh, highly technical, one of the pioneers in the space, wrote about in, in 1996. Simpson Garfinkel, also, you know, well known in the industry. He wrote this in 2003. So the notion that, you know, this is no, we didn't know about it, etc. You know, companies, you know, your, uh, your management can't use this excuse because this is, you know, well known, well documented in the industry. Um, one of the issues also is, is that when we talk about data disposal, um, uh, hardware, you know, storage is extremely, extremely, you know, inexpensive. You know, here is a, uh, you know, a Dell laptop with a, uh, uh, you know, terabyte hard drive, you know, four hundred dollars. Here's a um, an external hard drive, eighteen terabytes. Uh, for a few hundred dollars. And we're sort of desensitized to, uh, to gigabytes of data. Often people, you know, people who flew out here have, you know, if you've come from overseas, you've had, you know, eight, 10 hours. So people will download 20 gigabytes of videos, you know, to watch on the plane, um, et cetera. But it's estimated that the Library of Congress <coughs> has 20 terabytes. The, you could fit the entire Library of Context, the text, uh, in 20 terabytes of data. Uh, this is not, you know, all the movies, this is not all the uh, photographs, this is the pure text. If you took every book, library contrast, you would be able to fit that in a hard drive, which you can, with an external hard drive, you could fit, you know, take on a plane with you. So that just underscores how much data is out there, how dispersed it is. And the data really is the, is the crown jewels. You know, this 
you know, hard drive on the left is a few hundred dollars. A, a MacBook, which is, quote unquote, an expensive hard drive, could be $4,000. Uh, but on that $4,000 MacBook, you could have millions of dollars worth of information if that's from marketing, it's from legal, it's from the executive. So that storage is so cheap, you know, think of all the data, payroll, research and development, financial, uh, that adds to the uh, urgency of the, uh, of the issue. Um, there's, you know, tons of <clears throat> requirements, you know, why businesses need to do this. It's pretty clear that, you know, they all need to do that. One of the myths a lot of companies will say is that, you know, who are we? We're a 200-person uh, outfit in Duluth. You know, we're a, we're a, you know, we've got, you know, 50 plumbers in Miami. You know, who's going to attack us? So the answer is, you know, every company uh, is... Uh, a potential victim for attack. And so to every company that has data, you know, they need to deal with this. You know, if, you, if you've got data, if you've got proprietary data, um, confidential data, this is something that needs to be dealt with. And this is, you know, often overlooked, not necessarily because of uh, malfeasance, not necessarily out of negligence, is that, you know, this is just not a lot of, this is not necessarily on top of mind in a lot of organizations. Uh, companies, when they think about security, they'll think of, Firewalls, antivirus, all these other things. But when you talk about you know data destruction, you know that's you know they don't even know about this, and the uh, implications are you know quite significant. As we said earlier, uh, Morgan Stanley was fined twenty-five million dollars uh, for them. You know that's perhaps you know thirty minutes worth of profit. So it's not really a big deal. Nonetheless, it was expensive for them. It was embarrassing uh, for a lot of companies. You know, getting lawyers involved. Uh, can be extremely expensive and can affect their bottom line significantly. Even if you're not at fault, any time, the thing you want is you don't want to get lawyers involved because they're expensive uh, just to pay for them. Your team needs to deal with them, so you're distracting your team from doing what they should be doing. And even if you're not at fault, that is still going to cost you uh, at the end. Morgan Stanley is one of those rare companies that has you know, tons of technical talent, you know, has, a, has a, a large profit margin, but a lot of companies who are on the edge, you know, don't have that. So there's tons of uh, reasons why you need to do this. Regulatory issues, uh, whether it's HIPAA, GLBA, PCI, there's, there's a lot of reasons. So the, the reasons are pretty uh, self-explicit. Uh, um, with that, you know, we, when dealing with you know, media, you know, there's people, you, your, your, your laptop will fall off your bed and it gets shattered. You know, there's Murphy's Law out there. But on the other side, data is remarkably resilient. And we learned that in a, uh, in a most tragic way, is that the Space Shuttle Columbia, when it crashed to Earth, uh, they were able to recover a, uh, a hard drive. Uh, literally, this hard drive fell from space uh, and they were able to uh, recover um, you know, almost all of that data. So you think, you know, if something falls from the top of a building, uh, it's, it's, you know, you, you can't recover it. But this is, uh, uh, th this was, had a, a number of factors, how it fell, where it fell. But it just shows that media is remarkably resilient. And due to that, you need to have these processes in place to make sure to uh, destroy it, to sanitize it when the time comes. And like everything else, you know, uh, there's, life cycles, you know, data is born, data is created, you know, data lives, and at the end, data is sanitized. And that's true for everything in life, in the physical world. You know, you buy a new car, it has that new car smell. Eventually, you know, you need to, uh, you know, get rid of that car. You know, so how do you do that? You could sell it, you could give it away, etc. When it comes to media, when it comes to data, that needs to be part of your data life cycle. And if a company doesn't have these processes, these policies, uh, this, if they're not dealing with data destruction, then they are leaving out a significant part of, uh, of their data life cycle. If they don't classify their data, if they don't put access control around their data, if they don't protect their data, and that's what this show is all about, data protection. Um, and if, if, if you don't have those processes, if, you, if you're not dealing with sanitization, data destruction, then you're leaving out a, a good chunk of that life cycle. It's sort of like, you know, when a person, end of life for a person, we take them, we have a funeral, you know, you just don't leave them, you know, by the wayside. And so this is part, a very integral part of the data life cycle. You know, I'm not going to read every bullet item, you know, here's, you know, six, seven reasons why you need to do this. 
Uh, there's many more. Uh, if you're going to sell your device, you're going to donate it. A lot of companies, um, uh, they'll swap out the computers every two, three years, and they want to be nice, and they'll let employees uh, either you know, have these old computers, they'll sell them uh, at a minimal price, or they'll even donate it to a, to a local school, a local charity, nonprofits, libraries, etc. cetera. So um, on these computers, before you're giving it you know, to these third parties outside of the organization, you need to make sure all that data is wiped. End of lease. You know, a lot of companies don't buy their laptops. They lease their laptops. And so when you send that laptop, those scores of laptops back to Dell, you know, whoever it is, you want to make sure that data uh, has been deleted. Um, if, you want to send, if you want to send something back also, um, you need to you know, wipe it also. Raid, hot spares. You know, um, many times you're going to do it if there, there's a ransomware attack. That's the... Uh, the scourge of the industry now is, is ransomware. So how do you do that? You're going to sanitize. You're going to wipe everything. There's a lot of regulatory issues. Each of them have their, their nuances there. So if you're in a regulated industry, whether it's PCR, whether it's HIPAA, uh, foreign, uh, uh, in foreign countries, they have their nuances. You, you have to make sure that you understand what the specific requirements are and how you're doing with data destruction. The good news is, is that if you do a good job of data destruction, if the formal processes, if you're doing it, your people are trained, 95% of these regulations, of these standards, there's significant overlap. So if you do it right the first time, any, any, anything new thrown at you on this is going to be relatively easy to deal with. And so, you know, often we think of data just on, you know, hard drives, but there's, you know, countless uh, form factors where data is stored, hard drives, USBs, you know, CD-ROMs, you know, camcorders, um, you know, if you're, uh, you know, corporate events, you know, corporate meetings are often filmed, that's there, you know, RAID, there's uh, GPS, you know, may have uh, data there if you're salespeople, you know, or going to specific places, that can be c considered data. you know, backup tapes, uh, you know, healthcare devices, etc. you know, all of those are storing data. And that on the bottom right, you know, a lot of, if you ask someone what it is, you know, people, you know, most people say that's a car. If you want to get a little more technical, uh, they'll say it's a Tesla. But the truth is, you know, this thing, the bottom right, really is a computer on wheels now. And that's what a lot of, even, you know, John Deere tractors are computers uh, that are, um, um, uh, you're doing, you know, farming work, and uh, now when a uh, John Deere is sold, it has a lot of software, and that the farmer has to accept the terms of service. To their credit, um, in in the owner's manual, Tesla does have a way to uh, erase all of that data. But you know, think about it: if this is a an executive's Tesla, and he's had it for a few years, uh, <clears throat> tons of information on the GPS messaging might be on there. So there's a lot of information you know, on that, in, in that, uh, in the car now, not just a Tesla, you know, every, you know, a, a lot of the newer models, you know, have messaging, have GPS, and all of these, you know, need to be put in that life cycle. So it's not just hard drives, there's media on tons and tons of, you know, countless, you know, form factors, and all of these need to be, uh, you know, put into your data destruction process. Um, and with that, it really needs a, a, a formal process. And what this means is that, you know, if you're a company, you want to make sure your admin in Los Angeles is doing data destruction the same as your admin in New York, as is in London, as in Singapore. And so, you know, these are formal processes written based on specific risk factors to your organization. Um, in the event of a failure, you know, lawyers will like to jump on things. You know, how did you do that? The, um, uh, when it comes to uh, criminal cases, um, uh, defense attorneys often try to attack the police on, you know, how did you gather the evidence? How did you process it? And small deviations from approved processes can get uh, that case thrown out. So you want to make sure these are done in formal, documented, consistent manner. Um, you know, here, and what does formal mean? You know, here you can see there's a picture of a goat uh, eating some paper. Now, is a goat eating paper a good data destruction process? I think definitely uh, it does the job. You know, if you're a, uh, you know, one person operation, you know, in the middle of Idaho and you've got a few pieces of paper a day um, and you're giving it to your goat, it's cute, it works, that's fine. But if you're a large organization 
and you try to tell the jury that, you know, the way we get rid of our papers, you know, we've got uh, goats, you know, uh, it, it's laughable. Um, you know, taking a drill to some hard drives, you know, uh, there was cases, you know, uh, the person in marketing, you know, had their um, son and his friends from high school, you know, take a drill and, you know, do, do a lot of these things to a whole drive, hard drives. Here was an author who <coughs> was, had his um, last works run over by a steamroller. These are cute, they're nice PR issues, but this is something a, a lawyer would jump on because they say, hey, this is not a formal, this you know, formal process to do these things. You, once again, your process doesn't have to necessarily be perfect, but it has to be formal, it has to be consistent. Uh, this is important also. It has to have quality control you know, built into it because even if you have trained people and you have good processes, you have good policies, you know, stuff happens, you know, thing, uh, mistakes happen. We'll talk about, uh, you know, degaussers later. You could take a wand and um, use that to uh, erase a hard drive. But, you know, these wands fail. Maybe it wasn't charged properly. Maybe the person didn't press the button hard enough and it didn't work. So it's very important uh, to have quality control built in because even if you've got everything, even if you've got the good hardware, your people are trained, you know, mistakes happen. And that's inevitable. Once again, you don't have to be perfect. But <clears throat> make sure you know things are are uh, are caught and you know taken uh, taken into consideration. Uh, as you said, you know policy is important. You need to have a data destruction policy. A lot of companies have information security policies, access control policy, user awareness policy, accessible use, etc. And so you need a data destruction policy. Um, it needs to be customized to your organization with your specific needs your specific requirements. Um, the good news is you could, there's tons of templates out there uh, on the internet where you could download and use. Uh, the mistake you shouldn't do is just take that uh, and use that as your policy. You take uh, you know, company X and you do a search and replace with your company and you know, that's our policy. Um, I spent a number of years in consulting and I went to companies and looked at their information security policies and it's very easy to see where they did cut and paste. I saw companies mention, you know, mainframe policies when they didn't have mainframes. And that's, you know, quite embarrassing. And once again, if, if a lawyer would see that, you know, they would jump on that. Um, it, it, just take the, you know, getting the policy is the easy part. Getting that template is easy. Customizing it uh, is the key point. And that's where you really need to um, uh, do things right. Uh, we see this a lot also, uh, people who download wills off the internet. They'll download a, a will and they'll, you know, do it themselves. Uh, for most people, that is okay. But when there's a lot of money involved, you know, that is not the way to do it. Uh, because if they do that, it gets messy, uh, you know, quite messy afterwards. So it pays to do it right. Give your people the time to do that. Have them take the time to create a policy that works for your organization. So, and with that, you know, we've been talking about, you know, do data sanitization, do the destruction, do it, do it, do it, because it's very important. Uh, with that, there's a time uh, where things have to come to a complete hold and stop. And this is called a, a legal hold, a litigation hold. This is when, for um, legal reasons, maybe the company is in a lawsuit, maybe there's regulatory issues, where you actually can't do this, where you actually have to stop that. This will, these legal holds, you'll see this from... Uh, legal counsel, um, they, they'll make it quite clear to the organization that you know, all of this has to stop. Many times it could go to the point where they will tell people, uh, stop deleting any emails. Uh, this is a extremely serious issue. It's not something most organizations run into that often, but it does, you know, qu it does occur quite often. Um, and, uh, and your policy needs to ensure that the notion of a legal hold, these moratoriums are put into place because if this is put into place on, on Monday morning, and on Wednesday morning your team is shredding hard drives, uh, that's called obstruct, that could be potentially viewed as obstruction of justice. And that is a extremely uh, serious offense. Um, it, uh, it's bad in the press, it's bad in the courtroom, it's extremely expensive. Um, here's a case here, DOG, um, uh, sanctioned Google for intentional destruction of chat logs. So it is a, it's a double-edged sword. It's on one side, data destruction is an imperative, and if you don't do it, there's legal recourses. And on the other side, 
if you do do it, there's legal recourses. Sanitation morator moratoriums don't happen that often, but you need to have, make sure this is baked into your process because uh, in the event it does happen, your people know how to do with it because if they don't and they do that, um, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but if you speak to lawyers, they'll use terms like presumption of guilt. So it's, uh, it's sort of a, a fast track way uh, to guilty and that's something you definitely don't want. Uh, this is another thing also, recycling is green, you know, but it's not sanitization. So what does this mean? Is that companies, larger companies will have hundreds, perhaps thousands of, of hard drives. Uh, they'll have uh, a lot of tapes from, from their backup tapes and they say, you know, how are we going to get rid of them? Uh, the right way to do that is to make sure it's part of their data sanitization process. Uh, if you look, there are companies that will buy old hard drives, buy your data tapes, which is, uh, seems like a win-win situation. You've got this room of data tapes. Uh, you could sell them, you know, 3,000 tapes for, you know, $3,000, $1,500, et cetera. Um, this is great from a recycling perspective, but from a sanitization pe perspective, this could be a, uh, a horror story because a lot of these firms are recyclers. You know, recycling is fantastic, but there's recycling and there's secure data sanitization. You know, many of them will write that, you know, they have processes, they have all of these things, but when it push comes to sub and you're signing a contract with them, if they have a contract, you know, they're not going to accept that liability. Um, so if, you, if you're at the point where <clears throat> you're a company where you need the money to sell your tapes, there's really a, uh, a, a bigger issue out there. It's sort of like blood donation. Donating blood is, a, uh, is quite virtuous, but you know, if, you, if you're donating blood because you need the money, that's indicative uh, of a bigger problem. There are a few companies out there uh, that will take, uh, buy your tapes for free um, and uh, agree you know, that they've got these processes, but the, at the end of the day, just don't do it. If you want my advice, it's just not worth it. If you have a few hundred tapes, you're going to make a few hundred dollars. Uh, in the event something happens, you know, a few hundred dollars is uh, you know two hours of legal of of, uh, of of time from the lawyer. And, and when you've got cases like this, you know, lawyers just don't work for two hours. You know, they've got two, three, four people, you know, working scores, hundreds of hours. So it's just it's completely not worth it. If you look in uh, Consumer Reports, occasionally they have things that are called Best Buys. These are a good deal. Uh, but this is probably a, a worse buy. This, but once again, this is something you should be aware of. Uh, you know, don't sell your tapes. Uh, you know, don't give them away because it's, uh, the, the risk reward is, uh, is just not in your favor. Um, so, you know, how do you do this? You know, where's the documentation? So there's uh, the sort of the gold standard of this is a NIST uh, special publication 888 called Guidelines for Media Sanitization. And this is where the term sanitization is used. And this is, the, uh, this is a great document. Uh, if you're a uh, US, tax, US citizen, this is your, uh, these are your tax dollars at work. Uh, you could go to the NIST website and uh, download it for free. It's a great reference document that will tell you pretty much everything uh, you need to know um, about you know, data sanitization. It's, uh, about 100 pages, it really has everything where it talks about the general processes, it has different classifications, uh, it talks about decision making, uh, it enables you to create your own policies and processes. One thing, don't go to Amazon and um, look for this because at Amazon there's people who actually, there's a whole sub-industry, sort of a digression here is they'll take public documents and sell them on Amazon. What they're doing is they're, they're printing, them, printing them themselves and selling it to you. So if you go to Amazon, I'll look for NIST SB 888, five, 10, you know, $25 for this. this is, they're doing the same thing you could do from your printer uh, for about 45 cents. And this, there, there's tons of public documents out there uh, on Amazon that people have uh, created an industry of, uh, uh, they'll print it for you at uh, exorbitant prices. Um, you know, Amazon doesn't care uh, because you know, their goal is, uh, is profit. But, if you're, if you're thinking about this, NIST, uh, the NIST 888 document really is the, the go-to guide. Uh, this has pretty much everything uh, you need to know on the topic. 
There are, uh, you know, some lackings, um, like a lot of uh, things from NIST, from ISO. There are gaps uh, in updating, you know, so with that, the, the IEEE has come out with their own uh, document. ISO has come out with it, so you could, here, here's two reference documents to, to look at if you want some, uh, some things that have a little more uh, tactical information. But for the bulk of organizations, you know, start at SP888. Uh, that is a great document. It's well written. It has pretty much all of the uh, all of the information you know you need to know about you know for this document. They're not once again. It's obviously vendor agnostic. Um, they don't talk about specific vendors how you do it. They give you the information. You know you have it, and then uh, you decide. And with that, um, they use th um, three different types. What they call this is 808. They have three different types of sanitization. There's clearing, purging and destroying, sort of sounds like uh, laundry detergent here. But clearing is really, you know, clearing the data. Think of it like a, uh, uh, like a chalkboard. You're just, you know, erasing uh, that chalkboard. You know, purging it is, uh, is should we say, more a, a deep cleaning of that uh, chalkboard. And then destroying the chalkboard, uh, you know, think of high school students, you know, they're destroying that chalkboard. That is the most uh, aggressive form of sanitization. Obviously, with that, you know, you can't reuse it uh, after that. So we'll take, uh, spend a few minutes, you know, talking about uh, these various aspects. Uh, you know, once again, what is the, talk about this in a, in a slide in a few, but it, it's important just to reiterate at this point is, you know, what is the best method for doing things? And uh, about half of my career was spent in consulting, and the other half was internal corporate, and that's, you know, where I am now. And often, you go to clients and they say, you know, what is the best product? You know, what's the best firewall? You know, what's the best um, you know, web application firewall? You know, what's the best? And uh, in some ways, it's like going to a pharmacy uh, and asking the pharmacist, you know, what is the best drug? Um, you know, no one would do that. You know, sometimes the best drug is to do nothing. You get bed rest. And what the best drug for one person is, you know, will be fatal to the other. In technology, it's not as drastic, but what the best product for you is, you know, what are your needs? Uh, you know, what is your data? What are your specifics? And then once you know your requirements, you, you could go from there. A lot of companies, um, you know, they put the cart before the horses. You know, they think about products. They'll read a Gartner Magic Quadrant, look at these products on here and say, yeah, let's go with them. But maybe, you know, those products don't have their specific needs. What the, the way to do things is, Create detailed design documents. Write what your needs are, what your requirements are. In looking at a product, you know, here's the must-have items, here's the nice things, you know, here's the option. And then you map that against your specific product. And so too with all of these, what the right approach is, is dependent on your organization. If you're a pharmaceutical company with a massive R&D budget, you're going to need to have a, a much more aggressive approach to sanitization than, say, a, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a plumbing company, you know, with, uh, you know, 100 plumbers. You know, the data is very different. The business case is very different. Uh, the risks are very different. Um, and, and so with these different types, there's a lot of different ways to do things. You could do things in hardware. You could do things in, hard, in software, et cetera. Um, each of them has their pluses, each of them has their minuses, and you need to think about, you know, what are your needs and do these work? So software is a great way to do it. You know, here's, we, we could, you know, I, I could have created, you know, a table of, you know, 20 items here. Um, I'm not going to read every one, but single pass is adequate. You know, the downside is software is very slow, and if you, in you know, 10, 15 years ago when hard drives were smaller, you know, just having an overwrite of every bit, uh, every uh, sector on that hard drive, you know, took a chunk of time. Now when we've got, you know, two, three, four terabyte hard drives, doing that overwrite can take a significant amount of time. It's relatively easy. Uh, the good side is you could configure specific data files, partitions. A lot of, uh, if you've got Norton, if you've got McAfee, a lot of these have the ability to actually uh, shred uh, specific files, um, specific directories, so you could do that. Um, uh, the downside, separate licenses. Um, it can take a significant time if you have a lot of hard drives and you've got a, um, um, a lot of hard drives and a lot of big hard drives. Uh, important also, like everything else, it's ineffective 
uh, without good QA. It's not a matter of just shredding it once. You need to do that and have QA built in. You want to look in and say, you know, one, you know, out of every, you know, 10 hard drives, you know, take one out of every 20 you do, look at one and make sure is the data really not there, you know, uh, and do that and make sure it is really working. It says, you know, people make mistakes, people are busy, you know, they'll click on the, uh, the wrong button, they'll do things uh, and that, that. So you really need to have, you know, bake, you know, uh, QA built into that. Uh, it's not scalable. Once again, if you've got a lot of hard drives, you know, these, th these can take, you know, significant. Um, you'll see, you know, the term single pass, multi pass, you know, many times in hard drives. The uh, basis has it in an old Department of Defense document, 5220.22.m, that came out in uh, 1995. The uh, 5220 standard said, you know, three passes, uh, three overwrites uh, to that. And so what they did, it would do it once, write the whole drive. And so this is extremely time intensive. Once again, this, is from a, this was from a Department of Defense standard, and the, and the Department of Defense has very different requirements than corporate America. In NIST 888, they've updated that. It's also important to know uh, 5220 has been retired. You'll still, you will still see vendors using documentation referring to 5220. It's a uh, retired document. Single overwrite pass with a fixed pattern, such as binary zeros, typically hinders recovery of data even if state-of-the-art lab techniques are applied to attempt to retrieve the data. What this means is, if you do this, you're fine. You know, can a nation state possibly uh, recover that data? Maybe. But once again, in a court, you know, could you defend yourself and you say, hey, we have these processes in place. We did this. You know, we used, we followed NIST 800. We used McAfee. We used this overwrite program, et cetera. We were hacked by a nation state. You know, this company did everything which is reasonable. Is that going to happen? You know, highly unlikely. You know, once again, when you get into, you know, some technical forums, when you get into these barroom discussions of how many overwrites, uh, you know, some people will say do more. At the end of the day, your lawyer is going to tell you, you know, NIST 888 says one overwrite is enough. That is the best practice. That's a standard. That's all you need to do. So if you want to do more, feel free. But you should know this is, you know, more than enough. There's, um, here's a paper some years ago, overriding hard drives, the great wiping controversy. It's a great technical uh, discussion. Uh, sometimes, you know, one mistake people make in uh, technology in general and sometimes in, uh, in security is they will obsess sometimes on the small items. On one side, it's those small items, that minutia which could completely undermine things. On the other side, it's just a, a waste in time. So single pass, multi pass, you'll see a lot of debate over it. At the end of the day, single passes is more than fine. You know, absolute destruction, you know, does something need to be obliterated? Rick Edelstein, grind, what, how do you do absolute? Grinding media to a particle size smaller than the smallest recoverable unit, melting it to assure data can never be recovered. So it's important also, you know, don't confuse the real world with that of Jason Bourne with the, uh, the Da Vinci Code. Imagine you know, you're walking by the CIA and uh, you see some guy throw a hard drive out of the window, lands in the street, it shatters, and now you've got this hard drive. You know, you're going to run. Now you've got this hard drive in, you know, a hundred different pieces. You know, retrieving all of that data is a massive exercise. You need a lab to do that. Someone with highly trained skills. Can it be done? Certainly. That is going to take, you know, hundreds of hours to do um, uh, in a specialized setting. Um, very few companies, you know, have, have those risks. Very few entities are going to have their people spend hundreds of hours um, doing that. So, yeah, in, you know, in the Bourne stuff and, you know, other science fiction, these happen. But once again, if, if a, it's important, you know, to, to know what is reality, you know, what is done, what is state of the art. And if you shred it once, the state of the art might be able to undo that. But, you know, you can't spend your life, you know, dealing with these theoretical threats. There's plenty of real world practical things you need to deal with. Even, you know, the big nation states, uh, have a lot of people dedicated uh, to attacking foreign adversaries. You know, China has made it, you know, eminently clear, you know, they are doing this. They have tens of thousands of people. But once again, even China doesn't have unlimited resources. So don't think that, you know, you're necessarily going to be a, uh, 
uh, attack by a nation state. You really have to understand, you know, don't, over, you know, don't overthink it. Uh, so hardware-based, uh, hardware there's a thing called degaussing. Uh, this is where you could use something to zap, you know, that's not a technical term, but uh, zap all of the data, all of erase it. All of that data is magnetized, so the degausser really you know, undoes that. It's a very quick way of uh, sanitizing all of that data. Uh, the NSA has an EPL, uh, Evaluated Products List. Uh, you want, if you're serious about this, you want to make sure your product is on their list. These are certified devices. They will be more expensive, uh, but if you want to do it done right, make sure it's on the EPL list. Important to understand that degaussing is a destructive process. Uh, once this hard drive, once the media is degaussed, uh, once this hard drive is degaussed, you cannot reuse it. It destroys the servo. Uh, so this is a great way to permanently uh, destroy data. Uh, but if you plan to reuse the drive, don't do it. If you've got a, uh, a lease drive, if you have something you have to return uh, to the manufacturer, don't do that uh, because it will uh, uh, destroy the drive. If you uh, degauss your drive and you send it back to Dell, uh, they will charge you a, a lot of money for that hard drive. Um, also, it's important, you know, degaussing works on a lot of media. It doesn't work on all media. Here's what it doesn't work on, what it, what it does work on, what it doesn't work on in solid state, USBs, et cetera. And so you need more specialized approaches to uh, destroy this type of data. Um, the, you know, one of the best ways to do things is uh, physical destruction. You know, there's a lot of ways to do that. You could uh, shred it, disintegrate it, bend it. Um, absolute destruction. Uh, so what is absolute? It means you grind it uh, uh, to a size smaller than a single data block. This is 512 kilobytes, uh, which at this point would be 1 250th of an inch. And that is extremely small. Um, there's, I think, Gartner uh, Industries. They'll be on the show floor, a few others. They have uh, what they'll be showing at the floor. They've got shredders, but they don't do it this small. This is, uh, these are highly specialized devices. Uh, that the NSA uses. But once again, do you need to shred to 1 250th of an inch for 99.1% of organizations in the U.S.? The answer is no, because this is smoke. So once again, remaining, uh, th this is a 512K bit. You know, it, it, th that would take thousands of hours to recreate. Uh, you know, the rarest of nation states will do that. So is absolution, absolute destruction required? Uh, there's a thing called uh, Betteridge's Law of Headlines, which is uh, any headline that ends in a question mark, uh, the answer is no. So in this case, you know, the NSA, CIA, maybe they need absolute destruction, but you don't. Once again, you know, how much bending do you need? How much, you know, how, you know, how the, the platters need to be broken in how many pieces? This is something, you know, you need to decide, you need to think about, about your risk. There's devices out there uh, which will do that. Uh, the one on the right is a manual device. It's almost like, it uh, looks like an uh, uh, orange juice maker. You take it, you bend it, you break it, you know, quite easy. But uh, the one on the left is, you know, automated for a, a lot more volume, and these will break it. So these devices are uh, not reasonably in any way, shape, or form uh, recoverable. Um, optical media has its own uh, specific set. You can't uh, degauss it uh, when something is uh, on... Uh, read once media, you, you can't overwrite that, so they have their specialized devices. Uh, it actually grinds uh, the media uh, off the device. Uh, the NSA has their evalu evaluated product list for uh, optical devices, so uh, if you're buying this, you're serious about it, uh, make sure uh, your device is, uh, is on that list. Solid state drives due to the electronics, due to the way uh, data is stored on that, have their specific uh, set of benefits from a data destruction perspective. Uh, they have their own set of challenges. Uh, degaussing is not effective. Uh, overwrite is not foolproof. Uh, and so with that, on a solid state drive, the only way is, is physical destruction. Um, there are uh, vendors who have that. Once again, uh, if you're serious about it, uh, make sure your product is on the uh, NSA uh, evaluated products list. Um, the cloud uh, has revolutionized IT. Uh, you know, tremendous benefits to the cloud. Uh, but for every benefit to the cloud, 
there's a, a, a corresponding liability. Um, you know, what is cloud computing? Gartner has a definition. NIST has a definition. There's a lot. Ultimately, it comes down to it's you know, someone else's computer. That's what cloud computing is. And when you're using the cloud, you're ceding control to someone else, and you lose that. When it's in my data center, I could take it, I could destroy it, I could override it. You don't have that in the cloud. You don't own the data. Uh, there's data, there's replication. You know, that's the beauty of the cloud, is that data is easily replicated. So if your data center goes down uh, and you've replicated that data elsewhere, you're protected. But with that, you know, can you uh, get rid of all your data? That becomes a challenge in the cloud because of that replication. It's a challenge of keeping track, you know, where that data is. A automatic replication is great uh, uh, from a recovery perspective, from a data destruction perspective, it creates its own set of, of, uh, of headaches. So if you're, uh, if you're using the cloud, you, know, you need to take this into uh, consideration. Uh, each cloud provider has their own set of rules, how they're doing this. Um, the good news is the big vendors, the big three, you know, GCP, AWS, uh, Azure, you know, they understand it, they're serious about it, they have their processes to do this. Um, it's very easy to think Jason Bourne is that, you know, you know, uh, you, you could access, you know, other companies' data. With that, um, highly unlikely this will happen. On the other side, you know, you have to make sure data is destroyed, data is sanitized. The vendors do that. Uh, once again, they may not do that to the degree you want it. It might not be the timelines, but overall, I found I've, I've never run into an issue, you know, with them. Um, there's way, you know, if that doesn't work for you, there's other ways you could put your own, your own solutions in the cloud, but that quickly, you know, can become, you know, quite expensive. You could try to create your own service level agreement with the uh, cloud providers. Often that could be, you know, quite expensive also. If you're a small, uh, even to a medium-sized company, going to Google, going to AWS, and you know, trying to create your own SLA, you know, they often will balk at that. The reason they're able to offer cloud computing prices, uh, which um, are often quite cheap, is because you know, they've got the same structure. They're doing everything the same. You know, once you've got a customized SLA, that's, you know, they have to change their processes. So unless you're a very large vendor, they won't do that. One way to, to fix that uh, is you know, encrypting. You know, encrypting the data, even if it is um, uh, even you know, if it's breached, you know, if, if no one has the keys, you know, they can't access that. That's the simplest and least expensive option, just encrypt all the data. With that, you know, key, there, there's the challenges to that, is that the devil is in the details to, uh, within key management, et cetera. So like everything else, you have to weigh the pluses, you have to weigh the minuses and make the decision yourself. So what is the best way for yourself? As I said earlier, think about what are your needs? What is your data? What is your type of data? What regulation? What are you dealing with clients? What are their contract requires? So you start really think about all of this um, and then you'll really understand, you know, what is the approach? Unclassified, you know, physical destruction is fine. Uh, highly classified, degosset, then physically destroyed. For most organization, an overwrite will work. But really, you know, think about, you know, what are your needs? What are your requirements? What are your risks? You know, who are your adversaries? You know, be pragmatic, be real. You know, make sure you've done a formal risk assessment. In that risk assessment, you could easily map that, you know, to your data destruction approach. But don't have a, a sort of a approach A when it comes to everything else, but, you know, you go Da Vinci code, you know, when it comes to data destruction. Keep it real, keep it uh, realistic, and you will be fine with that. You know, and, and that maps in, you know, think about, you know, this risk matrix. This is from a dis an organization as Europe. You know, who are the threat actors? Who are your, your enemies? Um, you know, if you've got an old truck on your big ranch in Texas, you're not going to have insurance. You're not going to have collision because it's not worth it. If you've got a new Tesla in downtown New York, you're going to insure that to the maximum. So really understand that. And once again, if, you, if you've got collision insurance on a 50-year-old truck in Texas, you're literally throwing money away. If you don't have insurance on your Tesla, you know, you're putting yourself at risk. So really understand who are your adversaries, what are your risks, and that will make it much easier to map everything from there. Um, so like everything else in IT, do you do it in-house or do you outsource it? Plus and minuses to everything. Doing it in-house, everything is under your control. Uh, your people are doing it. 
The other side is uh, the, the, this hardware, these things can become quite expensive. Degaussers are not cheap devices. Um, they have their own specific requirements. If you're using a big degausser, uh, you need a specialized room for that. You need to put uh, hazmat signs up, make sure people with pacemakers don't walk by. Doing it by your trusted staff. Um, the downside is, you know, do you have you know, good quality control? You need to have, you know, adequate space. Everything else, there's a yin and the yang, pluses and minuses. You know, outsource, you can just do it immediately. There's no capital investment. There's, uh, you know, your seating control. Uh, they can handle, you know, various levels. Um, sometimes vendors may require, you know, minima, minimal, uh, minimum controls that, you know, don't meet your needs. But once again, understand your risks, understand your requirements, and then when you decide to insource, outsource it, you can make a, a very judicious, correct approach. There is no, you know, which is best, in-house or sales, which is best, hardware, software. Once again, it's like going into the pharmacy, what is the best drug? There isn't one, it's, you know, what you need, what your requirements, what your detailed requirements are, uh, will determine that. And the more time you spend on your requirements, the better you will be overall. This works for everything, um, especially in IT. You know, spend, a lot of managers don't give their staff enough time to do that and spend time on detailing those requirements. But if you document and detail everything at the beginning, you're going to save yourself a lot of heartache and a whole, a whole lot more money at the end. So you know, taking it seriously, do things like segregating, segregating the data. You know, making an inventory. You know, how many hard drives do you have? Um, most you know companies can't answer that. If you ask, you know, how many employees do you have? You know, how many laptops? You know, you want these answers. Also, make sure that you know once these are meant for data structure, you know, they should be isolated. Uh, even a company who should know better, Oak Ridge National Labs, the place you know where most people have top secret clearances. You know, some years ago, uh, they stored, uh, they had an unsecured storage room where they had these you know, hard drives. So once you've uh, got your hard drives out there, once you've got their media, you know, make sure this is put in a highly secure location. Uh, so there's a lot of good information out there. Uh, your International Data Sanitization Consortium, uh, iSigma, which is formerly NAID, you know, they've got a lot of good things out there. There's a tons of things. Uh, uh, best Practice for Data Destruction came out a few years ago. Uh, a great new book out uh, by Richard Steenan. Uh, net and um, uh, two others, net zeros and ones. Uh, um, that's a great book. Uh, it takes NIST 888 and uh, brings it to 2023. A lot of great information there. Pretty much everything you need to know uh, how to do a data destruction program. Oops, I think I my apply slide got got, there. got deleted from here. Good, I have a backup copy. Uh, so there's the last, there's an apply slide. What should you be doing? So uh, in the next week, you know, br bring this topic back to your senior management. You know, let them know if you're not doing this, this is something, you know, really need to start thinking about. Uh, and build in, you know, formal processes. It's not a matter of just buying a degausser or you know, buying this hardware, you know, it's training your people. Make sure you've got these processes and, you know, build a strategy. Make sure this is done right, correctly. One thing we said is keep the lawyers at bay. You want to make sure the lawyers come in and are so happy, so overwhelmed that you're doing it right. They're just going to go away. Ultimately, so within six months, what you'd be doing, have this formal program for data destruction audit. Follow that life cycle approach. And once again, reiterate, make sure quality control is built into that because you, even if you buy the good products and you buy, have good people, things will make mistakes. So make sure QA is built into that. You, you do all of this and you will be in good shape. You know, hopefully at this point you understand the importance of data destruction, the need for it. I'm around after the show. Um, actually, my original presentation was much longer because uh, I like to talk about this. There's a lot to that if you want. Uh, you could follow me on Twitter, Ben Roth. You could email me, uh, brothy at Gmail. I could uh, send you that. Uh, the presentation on steroids with a lot of information. Hopefully this was uh, worthwhile. If you have any questions, please ask. Uh, remember to fill out your uh, evaluation form and please enjoy the rest of the conference.